the Rockwell Time Piece says it's time. So come on in, stay a while. It's time to get coached up with another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. And I am honored to be a brand ambassador for Rockwell. Go to rockwelltime.com. Use the code COACH20 for a 20% discount on any order or use the code HEROCOACH and when you buy any item, whether it's a watch or sunglasses, and you get a free hero watch of your choice, which supports the fire department, it can support the police department or any branch of our services uh, here in the United States. Like and follow us, the Coach Scott Field Show on Facebook. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can watch us on the DBTV network, which is Monday through Friday, 1 o'clock Eastern time on the DBTV network, which is Roku, Amazon Fire. In that network, you can see the Coach Scott Field Show in over 300 million households around the globe. Also on CSTV, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. and the Sports Rewind 60 out of Chicago. And next week, we're getting picked up by another network. And man, am I thrilled and honored for that. But the reason is, is because of guests like I've got on here with me today. If you're listening to us in podcast form, Coach Russ and I say, turn that knob up. We're about to put that flavor in your ear. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today on what is known as National Coaches Day. So who better to have on as a guest than my man? By popular demand, he's back because he was with us about a month ago and so many people love the stories. They're like, hey, have Coach Russ back on. Coach, part two today on the Coach Scott Field Show. Welcome back, my man. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm really glad to be on your show again, for sure. Oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. How about the poster over your shoulder? You know, instead of having the tiger up there, the LSU tiger, I thought I'd put the real pistol Pete up there. Wow. So, uh, this game here is uh, in the all college term in Oklahoma city in December of actually 68. Uh, uh, we beat Duquesne for the championship. And, you know, Pete, I think that's another game where Pete came out and he had maybe eight points at halftime, lit him up for about 42, the second half. <laughs> and, we, and we ended up winning the championship. But anyway, a matter of fact, that game uh, on this poster, I think it's against Oklahoma City, who we beat in the semifinals, uh, coached by the great, uh, great coach and unbelievable comedian uh, and after dinner speaker, Abe Lemons. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, it was a great tournament. And of course, you can barely see me there in the background because I'm, you know, getting ready to rebound because basically that was my whole career, Scott, was... <laughs> You know, pass the ball to Pete, or pick for Pete, and then get ready to rebound. That's what I'm doing here. But, you know, as you well know, most of the time he didn't miss. So here's my question. How many combined points did you and Pistol Pete Maravich have in that game? Against Oklahoma City? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> if I had two points or four points, I don't remember. <laughs> I do remember that uh, Oklahoma City had a very good team. Abe Lemons always had a lot of talent. And he was a great coach. And him and Coach Maravich were great friends. And it was played in Oklahoma City. So, you know, we thought that it was a tough place to play. Uh, they had, you know, it was a hockey ring. It was a state fairgrounds. And they had ice under the floor. And so you did not want to sit on the bench in this tournament. That's for sure. Wow. You got off and cold on the bench. You wanted to stay in the game or get in the game if you weren't in the game. That's for sure. But anyway, uh, we had, had, I think, the first night we beat Wyoming with Harry Hall, and then the second game we beat Oklahoma City and then, then beat Duquesne in the championship. And St. Bonaventure with Bob Lanier was in the other bracket, luckily for us, and uh, they got beat out by Duquesne in the semifinals. And Bob Lanier, you know, he was known for having those size 21, 22 shoes. And they liked our team so much, and we got to be friends with them during the tournament that they actually sat behind our bench and pulled for us in the championship game, hoping that we would beat Duquesne. Now that doesn't happen very often. When the team beats you, you're normally pulling for them to make you look better, but they were pulling for Pistol Pete and our team to win the championship. And luckily we did, and we all went out afterwards and had a great time. I'll never forget Bob, Bob Lanier talking to him and, you know, he was just so mild mannered and calm. And of course, such a great, great player. This was his junior year in college. And the next year, of course, he would be a senior. 
And uh, what a great, great player, but what a great NBA player. And I believe he's in the NBA Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, we have what we're going to call the one-on-one -on -one segment. And here I am with my friend, uh, Coach Russ Bergman, which is brought to you by Sleep Number. Out here in, in near Salt Lake City and Sugar House, get a hold of my man, Todd, 801-845-9058. He can help you save thousands on any purchase with Sleep Number. And I'm telling you, I was talking with Coach before the show started. If you've never had a weightless experience or temperature controlled experience, get on that Sleep Number. Give my man, Todd, a call. They can take care of you. So. Not only is Sleep Number the sleep partner of the NFL, they are also a partner of the Coach Scott Field Show. Back to Coach Russ Bergman. Let Coach me say this. Let me say this, Scott, before you jump to another subject. I think yeah. I, need to, I need to see Scott. I need to see this man you're talking about because every <laughs> time I wake up in the middle of the night and I start thinking of some bad call some referee made, or something <laughs> went wrong that we end up losing either a championship game or a tough game or something on the road, you know, I need that sleep number. I need one of those <laughs> go back to sleep. That's for sure. Hey, you and me both, because, you know, my mind says go, but sometimes my body says no. And I know when you're out there in Myrtle Beach, out on that golf course, you got to make sure you're back and everything feels good so you can have that sweet swing, baby. <laughs> no question about that, because so many times I don't have that sweet swing. <laughs> you know. It's all about the, about having a good time. And luckily for me, I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to make it on the Champions Tour. So I better <laughs> try to enjoy the game. <laughs> I love it, man. I love to hear stories like that. Coach, I, it was so awesome that when we did our first show and you shared stories about, you know, Coach Press Maravich and, Co you know, and, and Pete Maravich, just the overwhelming outpour of, people that were like man get coach back on let's hear more stories and i'm like hey let's give the people what they want tell us tell us more stories about maybe traveling on the road with coach press and you know what kind of things did you pick up from him you know being a sophomore and a junior playing with his son who was be beyond his time or before his time what were, were there any things that he did that you thought, wow, this is unbelievable to prepare his son and prepare your LSU Tigers for maybe a road game? Like you said, so many people, once you talk about Pistol Pete and put something on Facebook about Pistol Pete, every time I see something on Facebook about Pistol Pete and I either make a comment about it or I repost it or I post something on Facebook with Pistol Pete in it, I mean, the amount of thousands of people that hit that that little uh, website up or that little post up on Facebook that I can remember where I was when Pistol Pete did that. Or I remember when I was a kid growing up, I just idolized and fantasized being a Pistol Pete and I bought the gray floppy socks and you know, <laughs> I, I grew my hair long, the long floppy hair and tried to go between my legs behind my back and try to do all those passes, everything else. So the amount of people that Pistol Pete touch during his lifetime is just in the millions and, and and it's hard for people to understand that but you know it was hard for me to understand even to this day when I get those you know reactions on Facebook and you know by people I have no idea who they are and they'll hit me up and say da 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 da, da and Pistol Pete meant so much to me about this and he made me really like the game and he did it goes on and on and on and so he has Im impacted so many people uh, with the college game. And of course, he, like I told you in the last segment, how much he impacted great players, whether it was Steph Curry or whether it was Magic Johnson or I Isaiah Thomas. I mean, so many of the great, great players that w became great passers and dribblers and, and everything else and shooters, you know, they tried to emulate Pistol Pete when they were kids, just like I tried to emulate Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robinson, you know, and, and I was just old enough to watch Bob Cousy play some because he, you know, by the time he retired, I was probably just getting to maybe as a freshman in high school. I'm not sure. But uh, Elgin Baylor, uh, you know, I think I told you, I, unfortunately, the first time I met Elgin Baylor was at Pistol Peach funeral because he was one of Pistol Peach coaches with the New Orleans Jazz. Yeah. And uh, I got to talk with him there. 
in a very <clears throat> sad situation. But anyway, what an unbelievable, super nice guy. And Pete always told me what a great, great person he was and what a great coach. As a matter of fact, that was Pistol Pete's favorite professional coach. And of course, his favorite college coach was his dad, Press Maravich. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I love hearing that. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, you as a player, I was going to ask, who is one of your major influences on you and your game and your style of play to get you to LSU? Who was you trying to emulate? Well, I, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, it's just like Indiana, basketball is everything in Illinois. Oh. We had one class just like Indiana had one class. We had one state champion. And so when when Mark, March Madness came around, I mean, everybody couldn't wait to see who was going to win the district, who was going to win the regional, who was going to win the, the, uh, the sectional, who was going to win the super sectional, and then who was going to make it finally the final eight to the to the uh, final elite eight in Champaign, Illinois. I was, I can remember as a kid where they had the, still had the sweet 16. So 16 teams made it to the university of Illinois in Champaign. And then they cut it back to eight. And of course, one of those teams, one of those eight teams was a city champion out of the city of Chicago. So can you imagine the team that came out of there? Ooh. You know, they were an unbelievable team. And, and I can remember Chicago Carver with, with Cassie Russell. When they won, it, they won the, the the high school championship, and and because my name is really Russell, and a lot of people called me Rusty in high school, and then Russ in college, or mainly called me Berg in college. But anyway, I got the nickname in high school. You know, Cassie Russell, Jazzy Cassie, because you know it just because he's he was a Russell. Wow. But anyway, uh, he was one of the people, but I loved Oscar Robinson with all the magazines and watching him on TV because he had the total package. You know, everything, all the five fundamentals, he was great at all five of them. And when they would rate him or rate all the professional NBA players back then, and of course there for a while, there was only eight NBA teams. And then it finally grew to 12. And now, believe it or not, I guess we've got 30 today. That's right. But people don't understand, you know, when you were, Say you were with a uh, Milwaukee Bucks, and uh, when they won the world championship with 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 Oscar Robinson and, and Lou Alcindor, there was a kid named Bobby Danridge who was an unbelievable, great, great player, and he was he was a backup. Yeah, he was a backup because wow. I think there might have been I don't know twelve or sixteen NBA teams, but Oscar Robinson did it all, and he was on a that big O. Yeah, and he was on that team. So, you know, it's and I I was fortunate enough. Uh, my first college job was at College of Racine in Racine, Wisconsin, and uh, uh, Lou Costello, the coach of the uh, Milwaukee Bucks, had they had a bas summer basketball camp at our college, and uh, and I I was selected to run the camp, so I got to know Coach Costello. And matter of fact, even rebounding him one day over lunch, he, even though I don't know how old he was, and whether he's forty five or fifty, or whatever, he stepped up and made a hundred free throws in a row. Wow. He's the guy that, that set, he shot the long two-handed set shot still in the NBA. And I can remember him playing back in the day in the NBA. And then, of course, they had, uh, like I said, they had uh, Bobby Dandridge and they had uh, Lou Al Alessandro, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and, and uh, you know, they had so many great players. Wow. Good stuff right there, ladies and gentlemen. We're uh, talking with Coach Russ Bergman. It is National Coaches Day, so shout out to all the coaches who are impacting lives, teaching life lessons, and doing it the right way. And my guest is definitely one of those guys who, for years, has done it the right way. That's why I'm thrilled and honored to have him here on our show. Um, Coach, love hearing the history. And I think that's where a lot of people miss today is that for me, I'm a historian and on my show, I have a lot of guys that pave the way for some of these younger generations of today to play the game and be successful. So to hear these stories, it just resonates with me because to know where we're going, you have to know where you've been. And to hear you talk about Bobby Dandridge and Lou Alcindor and, and the big O Oscar Robertson, who's an Indiana boy, who's in that Indiana Hall of Fame, it just thrills me. And to think that you got to play alongside the great Pistol Pete Maravich, some of the things that stood out in your mind playing alongside of him at LSU, 
what did you recognize about him immediately when you first got to see him and kind of like, okay, so here, here's all, what's all the stories, but now I can see why he's so good. Well, you know, um, I, we have two daughters and as you watch your daughters grow up and of course they were in dance and ballet and all that. And girls are great at emulating other girls. And so while they're teaching them, they pick things up so quick. And, uh, you know, for some reason, boys and guys don't pick things up quite as quick as girls, it seems like. But, you know, I think that's one thing when you have a great, great player and, and an All-American like Pistol Pete as a teammate, you try to learn from people like that. And, and same way with your coach. When you have a coach like Press Maravich and Coach Jerry McCreary, who was our associate head coach, which I talked about, you know, in the state of Indiana, everybody knows Coach Jerry McCreary. And uh, just an unbelievable, great Indiana Hall of Famer also, and All-American at Indiana who, who, who won the national championship with Indiana, Jay McCreary did. But Coach Maravich, you know, I learned so much from him as far as the X's and O's. And, you know, I think with every coach, you learn things that you think will fit into your philosophy, things that will work and do, and things that you may not do. There were certain things that, Coach Maravich did that I, I definitely added to the things that I do even today the same way there were certain things I said you know I don't think I'm going to do it that way the way he was doing it but there's other coaches whether it be John Wooden or could be Abe Lemons or whatever but but John excuse me John Wooden I mean my gosh I mean who didn't try to copy something from John Wooden or from Dean Smith I don't know if I talked to you last time about the about the sideline break that I stole from Dean Smith that, that led us to beating Wake Forest at Wake Forest, our second year of being Division I at Wake Forest. Did I tell you that story? No, please share that. So, so you know, we, we steal from everybody as coaches, and then we try to add them to our playbook. We try to add it to our basketball philosophy. And uh, I can't remember who ta taught me this from Dean Smith, but Dean definitely originated it. And what he would do, he'd run a play called a 512 or a 413, and he can call it out from the sideline, kind of like a football coach would or whatever. Of course, basketball coach has got numbers and all this stuff too with, with plays and calls. But anyway, if he called a 413, that meant that the, <clears throat> the four man would take it out. So you would take it out on the four man side of the court which facing the basket where the other team was shooting the free throws, that meant it would be on the right side. So the four man would be lined up so he could get it out of the net and we would run the fast break down the right side. And of course, the one three stood for 413 meant the person at the free throw line extended on the same end they were taken out. He, he got to the free throw. The three gets to half court and the name, the lowest number not called He's down on the same strong side corner all the way at the other end, maybe at the free throw line, depending on where he can get to, what's his shot on the sideline. And then the highest number not called, which in the 413 is a five man. So the five man would go to the ball side block as fast as he could get there. So when we ran that against Wake Forest, I set it up for a kid named Richard Scandlebury out of London, England, that uh, one of my assistants, he, uh, he saw this kid in a summer basketball camp over in London, England. He says, coach, he said, there's a chance we could sign this kid. He said, he said, I think he's a heck of a player. I said, well, you know, good from bad. I said, if you think he can play for us, you know, let's offer him. And so uh, we started recruiting him and, and basically we didn't fly him over on a visit. We basically, you know, signed him on what my assistant thought. And when he came in as a freshman, he was so smart coming out of London, London, London schools. He exempted the whole first semester and part of the second. Wow. Yeah. He, at graduation, he apologized to me. He says, coach, he said, you know, I want to apologize. He said, I screwed around a couple of courses and got two B's. And of course, the rest, <laughs> of them were, the rest of them were all A's. Yeah. <laughs> he made all A's and two B's because he thought he'd screwed around two courses and got two B's. But, and he was in probably the most popular had a great personality, one of the most popular players to ever play at Coastal Carolina, a kid named Richard Scandlebury. Anyway, 
he was the person I set up to take the shot. Well, he ends up, they were shooting a free throw and, and they make the free throw, which puts them up by three. And so we, I call, call it out, the play out for Scandalberry. And so basically we, we ran like a 412, which meant he was a three man. So he was going to get the shot. And so they score, we make, we make one, two passes, Scandalberry gets it, shoots it at the buzzer, three pointer, good. So wow. we, go into, yeah, we go into overtime. Of course, Bob Snack, Stack, and the rest of Wake Forest, they're thinking it's going to be easy cupcake because <laughs> Coastal Carolina. So, you know, it's a big guarantee for game for us. You know, they're giving us 20, 25,000, and we're going up there not for the guarantee. I'm going up there to win the game. And, and we, had a, we had a polished team and a pretty good team. And I always went into every game trying to prepare my players to win. We never went in there thinking we're going to just try to come close or not embarrass ourselves. So anyway, he makes the three. We tie the game. We go into overtime. And then in overtime, Scandalberry, Scandalberry makes it both free throws at the line at the end of the game, and we win the game. Woo! Yeah. That, see, that's a great story because, like you say, you know, they, they'll pay a smaller Division One school or, you know, Division Two, a you know, whatever – you know, for the win, and yet you get the money and you get the win. You you, you know, Coach Stack was upset. <laughs> no question about it. I mean, uh, I think he understood that we were pretty good, but they understood a lot, a lot better after the game that we were, <laughs> we were going to be a pretty good team to reckon with that year. So um, it, was a, it was a great win for us. I, I remember the Atlanta Constitution. It said Coastal headlines in the sports page, Atlanta Constitution, Coastal beats Wake. And of course, for a team like us, second year division one, that was huge. Trying to get, you know, better players to come and, and play for us at Coastal Carolina and help put Coastal Carolina basketball on the map, but more importantly, Coastal Carolina University. Santa Clara's baby, you got it. This, ladies and gentlemen, Coach Russ Bergman on the Coach Scott Field Show. This segment brought to you by Sleep Number for a technological advanced sleep. Get a hold of Sleep Number, and my man Todd can hook you up. 801. 845-9058. He can connect you anywhere in the United States um, with your sleep number uh, outfit. Coach, these are great stories. I love that. Also had a lot of people saying, hey, let's talk to Coach about the CBA, the Continental Basketball Association, and have him tell some stories of the CBA. And I'm like, done deal. You and I both coached in the CBA, but I came in at a time after Isaiah Thomas had bought the league and the level was nowhere near what it was when you were there. I mean, high level players, high level coaches, competitive spirit. Uh, you had the point quarter system that I loved that I wish people would institute. Talk about some of those CBA days and some of those CBA experiences. And when I say CBA, who are some of the first names that comes to your mind? Uh let me get to the CBA in just a minute. Okay. I do want to go back to, to Pete on a couple of issues, especially oh. in college and, and Coach Arabich too, and, and, and my teammates. I mean, we had a very, very close-knit group at LSU. And, uh, you know, some of us were members of a fraternity. And matter of fact, uh, I was a member of the Kappa Sigma fraternity. And, of course, I, of course, thought it was the best fraternity on campus. We had Tommy Casanova and Burt Jones and Ooh. some other outstanding athletes on that in that wow. fraternity, but you know, in the SAEs was Pistol Pete, and they had some great athletes on there. I think George Bevan was there, who was a great All American linebacker. So, you know, we had a lot of great athletes at LSU, but we had a great bunch of guys that really pulled together and really wanted to win. And Pete, you know, basically was our leader, and he led a lot by example more than talking so much because he had. He had so much on his plate to begin with. And, of course, uh, when it came game time, we were all pretty much ready to play. And, of course, if you weren't ready to play, when you ran out of that locker room, they started playing Tiger Rag, that, that pretty much would get you ready to play. <laughs> because you're, you're playing in front of a packed house. And the adrenaline is pumping, baby. Tickets, tickets were impossible impossible to come by. And, uh, matter of fact, on the road, I, thought, I don't know if I told you this before, but on the road, we would get so many tickets for the visitors. And of course, we would always take our tickets. We'd give them to the manager and say, it's sold out. Go outside and scout these tickets for all you can and then bring back the money and we'll all split it up. 
And that's what we do every road trip because it was packed house every road trip. And of course at home, I would tell Pistol Pete, I said, Pete, look, why don't you tell your dad you need a couple of extra tickets? I said, I don't know what you need a couple of extra tickets for, where you think it's for a faculty member, where you think it's for John Doe or whatever, but you get the couple of tickets. I know a guy we can sell them to that knows people that want to come to the game and he will pay me and then you and me will split the money. <laughs> so, because in college, you never have enough money. That's right. Yeah, so we did that. But Pete, I mean, the things that he would do in a relaxed situation in the first half and then, you know, was incredible because every time we would get the first tip, he would either take a couple dribbles and cross half court and shoot the two-handed set and possibly make it, or he would take a running one-hander like Clyde LaBella used to do with the St. Louis Hawks. Now, I'm, I'm really dating myself now. Oh, Clyde LaBella. Oh, Louis my Hawks. goodness. So what, yes. What the Atlanta Hawks, but I grew up about an hour and 15 minutes in Illinois from St. Louis, and my dad used to take me to go see Bob Pettit, Clyde LaBella, and all these great, you know, the NBA, They with Pettit, they won an NBA championship in St. Louis. Yeah. So well, anyway, I think you think Clyde Lavelle and I think Rock Chalk Jayhawk, the big lefty. Oh my goodness. That's right. I mean, that, I mean, Kansas, I mean, Missouri. I mean, anyway, some great basketball. But getting back to Pistol yeah. Pete and LSU, Pete would fill out what's going on in the first half. And sometimes he would be trying to score quite a bit. And sometimes he'd be trying to get us the ball and just trying to get the feel of the game get the feel what kind of defense they're playing. Because Coach Maribus, as a coach, you're trying to decide what's going to work best against Ray Mears' 1-3-1 zone. And, uh, or John Lotz, who was at Florida, also run the 1-3-1 zone. So to this day, Coach Maribus has got the best 1-3-1 zone attack. And it's so simple. It's crazy how simple it is. But it works like crazy no matter. As long as you've got a couple outside shooters, I mean, you can definitely – break a one, three, one zone down in a hurry. And, and this always worked for us, but he, so he's trying to feel out what he's going to do. And pistol Pete's trying to feel it because sometimes people come down at halftime and have six points, eight points, sometimes 20, but then, and then the second half, he would realize he would need to leave, take his game to another level and then another level. And sometimes he had to do what he, what he had to do to try to win the game. And he may be scoring 40, 45, 50, wow. 55, 60 or whatever. And sometimes even scoring as many as he could the first and second half, we still would end up losing the game, wow. which of course is a heartbreaker because, you know, Coach Maravich was definitely a sore loser. Pistol Pete was a definitely <laughs> unbelievable sore loser. I mean, his freshman year, they got upset at Tennessee, the only game they lost when he was a freshman. And he, he walked from the arena back to the hotel and it, nobody knew where he was. His dad was scared. I don't know where he is, what's going on. And he just walked back to the hotel because he was so upset because if that was the only uh, freshman game they lost. Wow. Anyway, same way in college, you know, when we would lose a game, whether it would be home or away, it was very difficult for, for Pete and for Press, especially because there was so much pressure on them being the father-son with any team, just like, like the father and son for uh, uh, the team in Omaha. Uh, uh, I'll, I can't get it out now. Uh. That's a, Team that's Omaha, a good. Nebraska, uh, the father and son combo. Oh gosh, I can believe I can't believe I can't. It's it's not Brigham Young. I'm trying to think of the team in in Oklahoma in, in uh, Omaha. But anyway, I will in a little bit. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so we had a lot of players that were doing everything they could to help, whether it was on offense or defense. And sometimes they they would have two and three people on and would leave somebody wide open on the other wing, like Rich Hickman, who could knock down the three pointer or the good shot. And then Dave Ramson came along as our center and really started playing well. And of course, Jeff Tribbett, who was a great point guard, he always could run the show left-hander, unbelievable, great player and, and, and a very solid leader and a silent assassin and sometimes a silent leader. But if he said something, people listened. And so we had a kid named Ralph Eucla, and, and Ralph was steady Eddie. He'd get about the same amount of points, same amount of rebounds every game. You know, Coach Maribitz could always count on him. He may only have been 6'3 and six, or 6'4, six, but his arms made him about 6'7. Yeah, wow. Wow. And, well, anyway, uh, all of us 
try to learn what we could from Pete and try to, you know, you can't just start dribbling and passing the ball between your legs, behind your backs, and do all these fancy things that he did during the college game and, of course, pro game, unless you put unbelievable amount of time in. Because as a college player, you try to play catch up and try to get as good as Pete is, you can't do it. Ooh. And that's what kids have to understand, college players and even pro players. You can't catch up overnight. You can't catch up in a whole summer. You can't catch up in three years. And that's what people have to understand. Pistol Pete put in hours and hours. I mean, when he was in the seventh, eighth, freshman in, in college, I mean, high school. And then when he was in high school, when Coach Maravich was the head coach at NC State, him and Les Robinson, who was a great coach at the Citadel, East Tennessee State and, and NC State, Pete and, and Les would play against maybe two recruits coming in. And, and, and Press would ask Les, he said, well, how good were these two recruits? He said, I don't know. He said, but Pete and I beat both of them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, uh, and, and Pete, you know, as a high school player, was an unbelievable player and could play so, for so many colleges. Just like in grade school, he played high school basketball at Daniel High School in Clemson. So anyway, uh, Man. my point is, we as teammates, we tried to catch up with Pistol Pete and could not. We just try to compliment him and his game, whether it was on offense or defense. And on defense, sometimes he was so worn out from one, two, or three guys trying to stop him that he would be rested on defense. And so we had to help pick up the slack and help guard his man sometimes that one thing and the reason why we won this all college tournament behind me was because Pete in that whole tournament, he worked his fanny off on defense. We had some great team defense in that tournament. And after we won the tournament, we were eight and one and, and we were ranked 18th in the nation. So I could go on and on and on and go through every game and all that. But uh, coach Maravich again, uh, and coach McCreary, just keeping your eyes open. And of course, a lot of times, you know, I end up on the bench or started on the bench or came off the bench. And so watching the game from the bench, you know, you're trying to see what you can do to come in the game and, and help your teammates. At the same time, you're trying to figure out what Coach Maravich or Coach McCreary are trying to tell us or what we need to do on offense or defense or what the team needs to do. Or maybe you see us changing our defense or changing our offense. So, you know, you try to, you know, on the job training. OJT, you try to learn from all these special situations. So, like I said, I could go on and on, and I can talk about the CBA all night too, and I can talk about Pete's NBA career. So, I'll talk right. about. What you want to talk oh, about. I, I love that, and and the thing that fascinates me the most, as if it's not all just mind blowing, is how he was so skilled and so talented under that amount of pressure, he could still flip a switch and take it to another level. That's that's major it really is and, and of course someone like him uh, like like jeff tribbett who uh was our starting point guard he made the comment he said because pete asked me all the time because he played high school ball with rick mount so oh yeah you, the how'd rocket you like play, how'd you like to play high school ball with rick mount in college with pistol pete maravich I mean, went all the way through college it was mount maravich and murphy is who is going to be the leading scorer in the nation and who is the best scorer in the nation. And even Jeff Tribbett said, he said, you know, I played with both of them. Rick Mount was definitely a more pure shooter than Pistol Pete, but Pistol Pete was a better scorer. Yeah. And Pistol Pete, don't get me wrong, Pistol Pete was also a very good shooter. But when he got hot, he was an unbelievable great shooter. Because wow. he would, he would go to another loan, you know they they make the statement he got he was in the zone or he got in the zone. Pete would get in the zone more than any player I've ever seen, and wow. he would he would just get unconscious and just start kicking him in. He could be had two guys on him falling out of bounds, and and knock it down. Yeah. I mean, and he could people be all over him. He take it take it going up like this, and all at once he had to bring it back over here and shoot it with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was he was incredible how he wow. could get shots off and still make them. Yeah, and, see, and when you say that, it's almost like you're not poo pooing Rick Mount, who was a Purdue University yeah. player, an Indiana guy. Here's a guy who was just an elite, smooth shooter from the state of Indiana, and then you got Pete Maravich, who's taking it to another level, being the scorer, who with his body control 
and with you know his his innovation and foresight was able to create shots off the dribble and in the air better than anybody at that time along with his ball handling and his passing skills phenomenal what made him to me so much better than mountain murphy number one he was six five and a half an unbelievable great great athlete we were playing at tennessee on the road and some some of his teammates started teasing about let's have a dunk contest and, and so well, come on pete come on get in it well they thought <laughs> Our big centers, you know, the big guys, we thought that one of them was going to win it, you know. And Pete, a great athlete, like I said, who could jump at six, five and a half, you know, great arms, great hands, long arms. And so he ended up winning the dunk contest. Wow. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable athlete. And, th and therefore, he was a better athlete than Rick Mount, a little bit taller than Rick Mount, six, five and a half. And Murphy was a lot ta taller than Murphy. And, Man, uh, yeah, and so anyway, because you know Murphy when he played in the NBA also, and Calvin Murphy, and and he comments about you know Pistol Pete's NBA career so much, and everything that Pete went through as an NBA player with the different coaches and the different teams, and and being a very difficult situation because, again, just like in college, he got so much pressure, maybe even more pressure in the NBA because. You know, first year out of college, he's making 1.9 million, and say Lou Hudson's only making 60,000, and Lou Hudson's you know former All NBA player, and so the pressure's on him to do well. And then when he's traded to New Orleans, they put so much money into him, they didn't have any money left over to go get all these other positions. Yeah, the role players that you need. That's right. Yeah, and and so that's what makes great NBA teams is having that money just like to buy all those free agents. Yeah. And yeah. at the same time, Red Arbach was a complete pro on lining up draft picks and figuring out a way how he was going to get this person in the draft, that person in the draft, put things together. Just like when Pete decided he didn't want to play for Tom Nasalki with the, with the Salt Lake City, I mean, Utah Jazz. And uh, so he ended up letting him go and letting him be a free agent. Well, Red Arbach immediately picked him up because he understood Pete may have had a bad knee, but he knew that he could still get something out of Pete that would help the Celtics. And Pete did, you know, he played, he, you know, he was in a more of a substitution role than he was a starter, but, you know, out of the, out of the, all the three point shot or shots he took with the, with the Celtics, he was, he shot, you know, 66%. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and I remember on the last show, Coach, we talked about, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you we talked about how Coach Brown later went back and kind of put in the three-point line to see what he would have really averaged if there yeah. was a three-point line when he played at LSU and the numbers just increased 13, dramatically. 13 points. Instead of Man. 44, he would have averaged 57 because he superimposed a three-point line into all a pistol piece a home and away games. Wow. Wow. And see that there too, again, to me is just mind blowing because here's a guy who could score with such frequency and such proficiency that it always gave you guys a chance to at least be in the game and compete and, you know, and, and, and win some of those close battles. No question. No question. Wow. About it. So whether it was Adolph Rupp or whether it was a couple of the other great coaches in the SEC. And back then there were some other great coaches and, uh, and some also some other great players. I, I don't have the time to go into all of them, but, yeah. but you know, Adolph Rupp said, Oh, we're going to let, let press his son, get his 45. We're just going to try to stop everybody else. <laughs> oh, wow. and, that's, and that's, and that's what he would do. Yeah, and, uh, I know one of the, the greatest feelings in, in my life was we were playing Kentucky on national TV at home and and I was on the right wing and Pete passed me the ball and, and that's at LSU. The, the benches were on the end zone, on the end line. Yeah, yeah, kind of like what Vanderbilt was Ruff, for years. Adolph Rupp was only about 20 feet from me and I ended up knocking down that jump shot and he stood up and stomped his feet. We always wore that brown suit and wore brown pants. So for me to be able to do something to make Adolph Rupp stomp his feet. It's something I'll remember the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> well, think about it. Who were some of those players on that Kentucky team at that time? Wow. You, had, you had Dan Issel. Yeah, you had uh, Mike Pratt. You had you had Mike Casey. 
Oh, yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of unbelievable. And of course, my sophomore year before when Pete was a freshman, you know, Kentucky had Pat Riley and Louis Dampier. <laughs> so, some names that a few people may have heard of. <laughs> two, players, two players that were first team All Americans and they got upset in the national championship game to Texas Western. That's right. That's All right. With, with, the, with, with Coach Don Haskins. That's right. <laughs> Bobby yeah. Joe Hatton in the group. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Picking your pocket, picking, picking those Kentucky Wild. Cast pockets and going down, laying it up, and won the national championship. Well, and again, if you think about that, of course, Disney made the movie about it. That was the first time that any college used five African American starters at one exactly. time, which which had everybody in an uproar. So, man, what great you know, stories! You know, Haskins did that on purpose because at the time they they were starting four or three blacks at the time, and of course he had enough blacks that he could easily start two other blacks instead of who was starting at the time and not take anything away from their starting lineup. And so he said, you know, to himself, I'm gonna make a statement. And of course, Kentucky was all white and Texas Western was all black. And for them to win, I mean, that opened up a bunch of eyes and all at once, a lot of teams in the South started signing black players to full rides. Right. And still when segregation was still a right. real thing. So again, exactly. think, think about how that pendulum and paradigm shift kind of opened people's eyes to being like you know what these guys are great players and you know they they can play and, he and help us be successful so man so many doors opened you know through your experiences as a player and as a coach and i still want to you know kind of briefly talk about the cba sure we, we can we can i love to talk that's, about that's the another whole show right right it's a great i love the cba it's a it, it's a, it was a great great league matter of fact it's a better league than the, than the g league or d league i don't care what anybody says you know it's just like when the when the nba only had eight or 12 teams that's all we had in the CBA. And now you've got like 30 teams in the new G League. Well, it's watered down. It, so it's it's no right. Players. It's saturated with talent yeah. that's not quite ready. And they're there to develop, which I understand. I think it's a great concept and it will get better. But when you were in the CBA, those guys were NBA level players and you had NBA level coaches who were out there competing every night. No question about it. They were they were doing everything to get that call up. Yes, that's that right. Day, and maybe they might get another 10 day and get 20 days of NBA pay money. And if they stuck, of course, then they got paid that the minimum that the NBA paid for the rest of the season, which was pretty good money back then. That's right. That's right. So, Coach, when I say CBA, who's the first coach that comes to your mind? Because there's been some great ones in that CBA. Well, I immediately think of Mo Mahone. Oh, yeah. We, we know, we all know that, that George Carl. Yeah, Flip Saunder, yeah. Bill Jackson, Coach Carl and Bill, Phil Jackson were great, great. Coach Musselman. CBA players, I mean coaches. Yeah. No about it. But Mo Mahone, I had so much respect for him when I coached against him in the CBA. Uh, like you said, Eric Musselman, Eric did it. He was like my my assistant, Jim Sleeper. Eric Musselman was a great player selecting talent. He would always, his teams would be loaded with talent. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, those, uh, Mike Tebow, who won, a, who won a WNBA championship. I mean, a great coach who coached in the CBA. I mean, I mean everybody we, we went against. I mean, you could go right down the line and – there wasn't any weak CBA coaches. Trust me. That's they right. That's exactly right. And, uh, and, and the thing that, that is dissatisfying to me, not only for, for some of the coaches that when I was in the CBA that did not get called up to the NBA as a coach, because a lot of them were definitely deserving. Didn't have to be a head coach just to move up as an assistant coach. Yeah. And, some of them did, looks like Flip Saunders, another great coach I didn't mention a while ago, who was at Sioux Falls that I coached against, that, again, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. Guess who his college roommate was? Great, great NBA Hall of Famer with the Boston Celtics when Larry Bird was there. 
one third of the big three. Who am I talking Ke- about? Kevin McHale, baby. All right, Kevin McHale. <laughs> to, Minnesota to, Gophers. He just happened to be the general manager of the Minnesota Timberwolves, so he brings Flip Saunders in from the CBA to be the head coach. But the thing about Flip, he was totally prepared for the NBA. He didn't have to skip a beat. I mean, yes, he knew the right person, but when he got there, he proved everybody that he knew what he was doing too. And uh, and there's a lot of CBA coaches that got that chance and got to prove it. But today, it's amazing how many people come from the G League to be assistants in the NBA. I mean, it's astronomical to me because there's people like me. We work like crazy to get on the NBA coach bench our whole life. You know, I, I scouted four years for the Utah Jazz, yep. but they never had an opening. Of course, back then, there was only three coaches on the bench plus a head coach. Yep. And now you've got like 11 coaches on the bench. <laughs> One much, for each player. <laughs> yeah, it's much easier to be – if you're not on the front row with the coaches, you're in the second row, consider an NBA coach. And you're making that money and you're making that NBA retirement money. You're exactly. putting those years in and that's huge for the, you know, for your retirement for the rest of your life. Yeah. Cause I think you have to have seven years of service to get that, you know, that income for the rest of your life. And those the coaches are able it, to do that now. I knew it used to be seven years. I, I didn't yeah. know for sure if it's still seven years, yeah. but. Uh, so there, you know, we could talk about every oh. CBA coach that comes to your mind and very difficult. Matter yeah. of fact, uh, Matt Calvin, uh, another great, I know he was an ABA player, uh, but I coached against him when he coached the team in, in Mexico city. And, uh, and I really liked Matt Calvin because when he was playing for Larry Brown with the Carolina Cougars, the ABA, I, I got to watch him because they were playing right there in Charlotte and had a lot of respect for him as a player and as a person. And we went down there. I don't know if I told this story or not, but this is one of the stories I got about those, those referees. Yeah. Anyway, we, we needed to win two games down there. I wanted to win two games. I don't know how bad we needed to. <laughs> as a coach, you want to win every one of them. So anyway, we win the first night, and we played back-to-back Friday, Saturday night. And so after the game and all the next day, I'm trying to – think, what can I do special? What, how, what news, something I can talk to him about? What can I do to help motivate our team? Did I tell you this story before? No, sir. So I'm, I'm trying to cross every bridge, trying to remember everything, <laughs> trying, to do something, trying to pull out some carrot that I could help our team win that night because I knew how bad they wanted to beat us. And of course, I wanted to win back to back and go home. So I finally said, well, you know what? I got the team's credit card. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw out to them that you got free dinner after the game at the Hard Rock Cafe in Mexico City. I mean, that doesn't seem like much. Oh, that's gold. But but to a CBA player, back then, our per diem was $25 a day, as you all know. $25 a day. Yeah. Now, it was. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. It was 150. It's probably 250 in the NBA. That might even be 350 a day there per diem. But anyway, so for the players to buy them a meal that they could put some of that cash in their pocket was big. And and so anyway, the game's going on. It's tight. I mean, it's nip and tuck the whole way. And and you know we played in that old Olympic arena that they used in the Olympics when the Olympics was in Mexico City. And in there, there was pigeons flying all over inside. And, <laughs> and the place was packed because, you know, hardly any teams, you know, they're not used to professional basketball there. And, and the fans are whistling all the time, just like they do a lot in Europe. Yeah. Whistling and, and this referee, he's running up and down the court, one on one side, one on the other. And uh, had this one black referee that was in, kept going in front of our bench. And all at once he stopped in, in, right in front of our bench on a dead ball and some pigeon let it go and hit him right on top of this bald black head. Oh. And I, I, I said to him, I said, you see what? The good man upstairs is trying to tell you that you're calling that kind of game. <laughs> when, uh. he, when he turned around trying to decide whether to give me a technical or not, I completely quickly grabbed from the manager a towel and said, here, wipe your head off. <laughs> I 
luckily, <laughs> luckily uh, he didn't give me a technical. We went on and won the game. And then after the game, we went to the Hard Rock Cafe. That's another story, trying to get to the Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> we couldn't speak Spanish. But anyway, yeah. of course, by the time I got there, we got there after the team, and they had ordered 25 appetizers and, and ate like kings. And, and believe it or not, the, the peso was very low, so – compared to the U.S. dollar. So we got off, still got off pretty good and had a great time. So great, that's, that's, great investment right there. <laughs> that, that's just one, one of the CBA stories, but unbelievable, great players. The, the competition, they, it was amazing how many games we would play in a week and how they would mentally get their bodies ready to go and physically get ready for a game. And some players would drink coffee before the game. Some game players would drink this stuff kind of like Red Bull. It wasn't Red Bull back then, but it was something like it. Yeah. And, uh, they're doing, every player is doing everything because you only you only dressed out 10 because your team wouldn't let you have 12 players because then you got to pay 12 players. Yeah, that's more per diem and, and another room you have to rent at the yeah. hotel. <laughs> so my, my, my third assistant was always a former player that just stayed at home because if I needed somebody for practice, I would just bring him into practice. <laughs> So we've got 10 players. Yeah. Uh, yeah so that's, that's the way it is in the CBA. But that's people, right. People that played in that game, I mean, played in that league, coached in that league, when they finally made it to the NBA, they were a different animal, different cat. And those NBA head coaches respected them for that. Just like the Houston Rockets, they were always bringing in CBA players. There are certain gen general managers and certain head coaches in the NBA that really liked really like CBA players. See, and I love that. And coach, we've got like three or four minutes left, but there was, there was a culture with that CBA and there was a fraternity within that CBA that is still tight knit to this day, which I so love and respect because in the fabric, the way it is now, you don't have that. And that toughness, like you just mentioned, when those players were called up from that CBA, I mean, think about it. You guys were having 20 hour bus drive, you know, trips to go play in another arena, you know, w within one or two nights. And man, that's not easy to do. But man, the toughness of those guys was just phenomenal. Well, luckily, I didn't get any of those 20 hour bus trips. We from Oklahoma City, we mainly flew about the only, oh. time, we ever, the only time we ever took a, a bus ride was when we went from, say, uh, Quad Cities to Rockford, Illinois. That's oh. about the only bus trip we took. But we were flying all over the United States and uh, mainly on TWA. And they kind of took care of us. They'd bump us up to first class all the time. But I can remember our players, they'd get on a flight. And as soon as they got on the flight, if they didn't get an exit row, they were pulling out $25 and $50 trying to buy somebody's exit row seat. Because, you know, in the plane, they're just, you know, we're talking 6'9", 6'10", 6'11", 7-footers. You know, even the guards are, you know, 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". Needed that leg room. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, they would actually take their per diem and, and, and buy that leg room. That's uh, how much it meant to him. That's but right. They would really go out of their way to, to take care of their bodies. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we have just been honored to uh, to have stories and experiences and, you know, hearing of the legendary, iconic Pete Maravich. This is my friend, Coach Russ Bergman. Coach, it's just always a pleasure to see you. It's always a pleasure to connect. And I can't believe how quick, you know, 54, 55 minutes goes when you and I are just talking, you know, about our passions and our purpose in life, which was just coaching the game. And I can't thank you enough for, you know, coming back as requested because the fans just love and the viewers loved hearing coach Russ Bergman's stories. Well, we've got a lot more CBA stories and we got a lot more European stories for, I got some great, great European stories for sure. We got to do it because I've know, got some stories got, for you too. <laughs> that's why I'm writing a book. The oh, book I love it. The, the title I picked out for the book is From the Pistol to Putin because I spent so many years in Russia. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to parallel, you know, all his playing days from, you know, from grade school, junior high, high school, college, pro, and then mine the same way. And then mainly mine goes in more into coaching, especially in, in the professional play. But, you know, I can tell so many stories about Pistol Pete 
in his whole everything about Pistol Pete because I was with him on the road in college, even at pro ball with his dad. Yeah, his, rooming with him on the road, right? With his dad for three years also and room with Pete on the road. And then over in Europe, you know, I have so many stories from Europe. And uh, so I can, uh, and I can tell true stories. It's not like I'm going to make stuff up. <laughs> That's right. I love it. Some of, the stories I can't, some of the stories I can't tell is like I told Anna said, you know, maybe it might be two chapters. You may not be able to print until I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, when that book is done, I got to get a copy and we're going to market it right here on this show because it's one great. I'll have to have in my in my library. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. Thank you to our partners, Rockwell and to Sleep Number. And thank you so much. Honored to call you friend, Coach Russ Bergman. Uh, thank you for your time and sharing stories with, with our viewers once again, my friend. Thank you much, so much, Scott. You're a great, great host and a great person. And you were a great coach back in the day. And you're still a great coach. And I hope, hope to see you on a bench again one day. Let's do it, brother. Hey, God bless you. Can't wait to have you come back on the show again to share more stories. Part three. Let's do it. <laughs>